<laughs> well, welcome today, guys. Welcome to convocation. The last couple of years, we have been doing so much virtually, and we've just kind of tipped our toes into the water, the face to face. But it seemed really not right with my soul to do a Zoom convocation with with Steve. It does not seem right. Steve and John Howie do not seem like guys to have it only on Zoom. We want to be face to face uh, with Dr. Budney, and we're so glad to be here. This begins actually us a series of talks called Last Lectures. In a couple of weeks, we'll be with Pat Kowalik in the art gallery, where she'll walk us through her art and, and, and the importance of art. And then we finish our series with Dr. James Riley, an English professor who shares. So, but today I am excited to introduce a man that you know. Um, some of you know him in the classroom. Others of you know his colleagues, uh, others of you just know him hanging out together. Uh, Dr. Steve Budney has been here since August of 2001. And I was thinking about how different the world was when we got here, and then a month later, things began to really change. Um, and I was pitting that with the idea of a changing world and a very consistent professor. You know, with Dr. Budney, you know what you're going to do, right? And uh, Dr. Budney has struck me as a colleague who if a student was interested in history and wanted to learn more, you could get as much as you wanted. You could drink from a bottle if you want. But if you didn't want to, you could also kind of check out, but you could really lean in and really gain some experiences. Uh, a colleague of ours who has really helped our students see the world literally going to places like China and, um, and consistently learning about a love for history. Um, and we are really thankful for you and all that you've done, the student organizations you've led. Of course, he has a PhD from Ole Miss. We won't hold that against you. UK country, but um, and of course, you know, you know, Steve, you know, he's one of the motorcycles in his big heart for dogs, and also for sometimes students that other people give up on. Um, you, you don't. And I've seen that firsthand. So a couple of gifts we wanted to give him. Um, this is the convocation gifts, the chaplain gifts. Um, there were three things, but one I could not buy this one. Which goes into a long story, and therapist Marty Green can vouch for me on that. Uh, Speedway would not sell me cigars this morning. I was very angry about that. Uh, it's a long story for me, but I know Steve likes it's probably much better cigars than they sell Speedway, but you know what I mean. Uh, humor me. Uh, two other things. Of course, we want to provide with some dog treats because we know Steve would not want to make a fuss about him because he cared for those he cares for the most. And also a shirt that I've ever seen that describes Steve. And it says, I'm, I'm so over it. So, <laughs> so, Steve, thanks for being such a great colleague. Thanks for sharing with us today, man. Dr. Steve Evans. All right, good morning. If you're on Zoom, I don't have any pants on. <laughs> um, I, I'm really going to keep this short because Rob just got to talk and Rob knows that uh, there's a big difference between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> so I'm going to keep this as short as possible. But when Rob first asked me to do this, I said, you know, well, what am I going to do? And my first thought is, well, what a marvelous opportunity to take a retrospective of my 20 years at UPIKE and all of my contributions. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> No, I'm not going to do that. And then I thought, well, what about the Spanish Enlightenment? I'm a history professor and I have this background in British political philosophy and I'd love to use and apply it to everyday life. But no, I'm not going to do that either. I, I mean, for obvious reasons, right? It, just because I, I torture students with that enough. So the next thought was I remembered an interview that Rob did with me a uh, year, two years ago. Uh, came to my office and, and asked me, you know, some questions about how I got here and about my education and my path to new pipe, what I've done in the past, what my interests were. And he asked me to sum up everything if I were to tell people what they should do. And I said, well, people should just do what makes them happy. Right? I mean, in the end, that's what you've got to do. You've got to think of yourself and you've got to do what makes you happy. So I said, I can run with that, but I can give you a cynical slant on it also, because that's what I do. And that's what people either like me for or despise me for. And I don't really care. 
but do what makes you happy. And I thought that was something I could work with and something I could expand upon. So I'm going to start with a quote. Does anyone want to guess who the quote is from? <laughs> Andrew Jackson. Wrong. No, it is Menke. Menke. There you go. Of course, it's from the great American cynic H.L. Menke. Now I had another one, but it's still on my door. And Menke said, "The basic fact about human existence is not that it is a tragedy, but that it's a bore." It is not so much a war as an endless standing in line, right? Now, I hate to stand in line. I hate it. And I hate to be bored. And honestly, I, I don't want you standing in line someday and saying to yourself, how the hell did I get here, right? So my purpose is to tell you what Today, I'm going to tell you what legions of inspirational speakers will not tell you. Okay? So just permit me to get into it and elucidate. Look, like a lot of people, I don't know if anyone does this anymore, but some of us keep journals. Right? And these journals are just uh, dry little musings about everyday existence, you know, existential nausea. And, and my, I've kept journals over the years, but they've been rather fitfully attended to. Sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't, but they haven't been totally ignored. Well, over the years, I'm not really a list maker, but over the years, I have made some observations and I've made a list of things that I should and should not do, uh, you know, in order to avoid frustration in order to maintain my focus and to avoid unnecessary grief and aggravation. So I'm going to share some of those today. I'm going to share some of my observations. I'm going to share some of my list. And I'm going to use them as talking points. Now, look, right from the start, this is purely subjective. Okay? Understand, this is purely subjective. Some of the more humorous points are the most subjective. And I'm just going to omit those. Uh, maybe I'll give you one. And feel free, as I thought, to either accept some of these observations or reject them as it may apply to you. Right? Apply it to yourself. Because some of them are quite superficial. Um, for example, and I'll know right? Easily adaptable. Number five. Never trust anyone who says, I'm doing it for the children. You know. Uh, <clears throat> So the first rule and the most important one, and there would be on this, is to find your own path. Okay, what do I mean? I know, I know, it sounds trite, it, it sounds cliche, but hear me out, right? Be selfish, be selfish. Are you working for your happiness and validation or are you working for someone else's? You know, are you working for the validation of others or are you working for yourself? Are you trying to make yourself happy? You're on a path and the path isn't, isn't narrow. You think it's narrow because people keep trying to push you off it, but it's a broad path. And there's a feast of things that you can sample along the way. So, so as you go through life, Right, be greedy when you sample these offers. Try a little bit of everything. Now, why do I say this? I went to work uh, before I was of legal job age, and I've had a variety of occupations, but most prominently, until I became a history professor, was I was an automotive mechanic, a motorcycle mechanic. I worked at Pratt with the aircraft on jet engines, ultimately saved up enough money to buy a farm in Maine. And because the winters were long and cold and there wasn't a whole lot to do, I went decided then and I thought, well, I'll go back to school and study history. And that's ultimately what brought me to where I am today, right? I found my role. Yeah. There's elements of Calvinism at work here. Know your role, never the calling, 
you ever had one of my classes? I talked about the calling. Know your role. You know what you can do best. You, you can only do your best if you enjoy what you're doing. The Calvinist, now, okay, the Calvinist message was for people living in a time that severely lacks social mobility or choice, but we can modify it. We can modify that and use it for our own purposes, right? Yes, know your role. Your role is to choose what you are best at and apply yourself to it. Only in this manner will you be able to rise above the robots because they're out there, folks, right? Only in this way will you be able to attain some measure of fulfillment and satisfaction. Don't be afraid to try something different along the way. <clears throat> it might be fulfilling. It might be what you want. It might be your role. <clears throat> Why am I thinking of Alice in Wonderland? Because Alice is, is it Alice in Wonderland or Alice in the which I'm through the looking glass window, but she's walking down a path, <clears throat> and all of a sudden it comes to a fork. It goes in two different directions. And then the bike in the middle of the bifurcation is a tree, and then the tree is the Cheshire cat. <clears throat> and Alice says, Which way do I go? And the cat says, Where do you want to go? And Alice says, I don't know, to which the cat replies, then it really doesn't matter. Right? Yeah. Choose your direction. The path can still be difficult. It's easy to succumb to pressure. It's easy to stray from the path. It's easy to take the easy way out, right? Over the years, part of my job, I have conversations with numerous people. I ask them, what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself in a few years? What are your goals? A lot of times I get these responses like, well, I think I want to be a lawyer. I think I want to be a doctor. I, there's no conviction in what these people are saying. There's no conviction in it. There's no desire for this. There's no passion in it. So I know they're being pushed in that direction or off the path by outside sources. And I'm sorry, I tell them unequivocally, if you think you want to be a lawyer, you don't want to be a lawyer. Some of you may have heard that from me before. Now, I've mentioned happiness a couple of times, and that really is kind of our theme here. <clears throat> what does happiness even mean anymore? Right? I mean, defining happiness, again, we're, on, we're in the subjective phase. Defining happiness is purely subjective. If you look at social media, it looks like everybody wants to be miserable. They are miserable. Twitter is created upon a foundation of disillusionment and vanity. Why? Why have people come to why have people come to set unrealistic expectations of happiness and fulfillment? People have become Disney adults. You know, they're escaping into a fantasy world of instant gratification that's anticipated, but it never arrives, it never comes. The best way to find happiness is to be satisfied with yourself. They're not satisfied with themselves. They're not satisfied with anything around them. <clears throat> be satisfied. The rest is going to come. It'll get there, right? Prince Charming may not be out there. I can assure you, Olaf is. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. We're about halfway through this. What about distractions? We're talking about going on the path or staying on. Yes, God, I'm not telling you to stay on the straight and narrow. I'm not going to get back to the dead, you know. But yeah, you're going to have distractions along the way. Let me hit some of these on the list. Uh, I focus your empathy. Okay, focus your empathy. Uh, I can't imagine how miserable it must be to be a true empath. That's not me. Okay. I mean, it's, I think it's fine. You have to recognize that there's horror and injustice in the world. 
And you have to recognize that there are people out there who are having experiences that are just as valid as your own experiences. The question for you is, if you care, what are you going to do about it? Right? Well, rather than scatter your efforts in a useless attempt to make or to cure the ills of the world, you need to find a cause that speaks to you. Right? Something that you can be passionate about. We talked about this and I said, well, I kind of got an empathy problem. And Tyler always says, yeah, unless you're a dog, right? And over the last year, 30 years, over 30 years, I have done uh, animal rescue dogs, getting them out of high kill shelters, taking them, you know, to save, uh, saving them from starvation or abuse. And I've done this for a number of years. Sometimes I adopt them. Uh, Daniel's helped me with the pirate, uh, English setter one time. Nancy and I took a trip. I always feel free to call upon you if I need to. And uh, that satisfies my natural empathetic tendencies. Right? It does. I mean, before that, I was a liter. Before that, when I lived in Maine, I was a literacy volunteer because I felt it was important to teach people how to read. That's something that's important to me. But my efforts are focused, right? Yeah, my efforts are focused. They're, they're concentrated. They're not ineffectually scattered. If you scatter your efforts, you're going to get disillusioned and you're going to give up. Okay? So focus your efforts. If you want to be an MFA, find something that speaks to you, something you can be passionate about. Everything I've done in this regard has been done out of my own pocket and on my own time and my own gas and everything else. So, <clears throat> oh, here we go. That number two. And uh, these are things that are high up on the list. The other stuff get, gets pushed down later, you know. Number four, be wary of well-meaning people. You know, what do I mean by this? Because you say, oh, wow, I'm really going off the deep end now. No, 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 but just listen. I've lived in the South for a number of years, and I know Southerners are intensely proud of this saying that they have, bless his heart. Bless her. We always reminded that I kind of said, you know, bless her heart, their heart, you know, it means someone isn't quite up to the task. They're a little lacking, or they're an idiot. <laughs> you know, that's what they say. Well, I don't want to be left out, and I, I, I am, so I've got to represent the North. We got to say enough North too, you know. So you, there's no end of people who are going to come up to you, and they know how to live your life better than you do, and they're going to give you unsolicited advice. And as they turn away, one of your friends is going to come over and put their hand on your shoulder and say, "They mean well." Right? Maybe. It doesn't mean they're doing well. You might want to look into seeing how their advice worked out for them if they followed their own advice, you know? So, yeah, they may be well. How are they doing? So just be careful of counsel, the counsel of well meaning people. <clears throat> uh, my last rule for you here, you can't be everyone's friend. I don't know how to break this to some of you, but you can't be everyone's friend. Yeah, it's kind of sad. We all know someone who wants to be everyone's friend, don't we? They're out there, you know? They just can't accept the fact that some people might not like them. But the sad fact is, is there's people who don't like them and there's people who don't like you. It might surprise you, I don't like everybody. <laughs> I especially don't like intrigue. I don't like drama. And I don't like professional malcontents. But yeah, I do, even no matter what, I do try to be civil in my dealings with people. Right? Civility, I think civility is important. And I think it's something that's sadly lacking in today's society. So at least I'm going to try to maintain my civility. 
Okay, let's take some of these in for a lot of sum it all up. Right? Here, here's where we get to the hard part. You are largely, but not entirely, responsible for your own mental self, your own mental self-sufficiency and happiness, right? And when I say self-sufficiency, I'm not talking about raising your own fruits and vegetables, but that's a good idea. You should do that too. I'm talking about your vitality. I'm talking about your confidence, how you feel about yourself. I mean, over the years as an instructor, I've seen people move forwards, but they don't go anywhere. They stall after they've left high school. They don't move forward after university, right? And they're the people who say, my professor gave me a D. Talk about how where that comes from. My professor gave me a D. It's an excuse. It's an excuse. They can't accept the fact that they had agency in that outcome. It wasn't solely the professor. In fact, we just glorified Peter's keepers. Right? But excuses are easy to forget. We've all made excuses. We probably forgot the excuses we made last week because we all made an excuse for something. Let's face it. Yeah. My favorite is if I go out, I stay somewhere too late. I got to go home and take care of the dogs. I've got an instant out. But yeah, it's an excuse. You forget your excuses. It's easy. It's someone else's fault. You move on. And then in a year, I'm going to see you on Twitter or Facebook, and you're going to be blaming your failures on capitalism instead of me. And so, yeah, great. Good for you. Um, but, and here's, here it is. And are you ready for this one? At some point, we realize that the world owes us nothing. I'm not supposed to say that. Right? No, no, I'm not supposed to say that. You knew I was going to slip this in. John Locke said you're entitled to life, liberty, and property. Entitled, yes. You have a life. And you should have the liberty to choose your own direction, to choose your own path. But what about property? Well, the Lockean theory of property is not that you're entitled to property, you're entitled to that property which you have cultivated and made productive. That's what you're entitled to, right? If you take your own direction, if you nurture your own happiness, if you cultivate your own happiness, it's yours. You're entitled to that. And that's the thing. We hear this term all the time, empower, empower. Empowerment's weird because I get the feeling that we, we want to empower these people, right? We're going to, it's like we're going to hand people empowerment or people expect it to, and, and after a while you expect it to be handled it to you. Handle it, handle it, hand it to you, right? Yeah. Hell, you want empowerment? The empowerment to do better is within you. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes circumstances are going to work against you. Sometimes you make the wrong decision along your path and you feel like a fool. But you don't dwell on that. You move forward. And if you move forward, you're not accepting failure. So, um, yeah, that, I, that, that was not a retrospective. I, I, I am egotistical, but I am not so vain as to think that anyone wanted to you know, sit here and be retrospective on my ears. But, uh, I have appreciated all the colleagues I've got, especially in social science. We've always had a good bad bunch over the years. I've had some great students um, who were more than just students who became friends. And yeah, and we've traveled together and done things together. And uh, now, next year, someone else will be standing up here talking about retiring, and I'll be sitting in Mississippi, smoking a cigar and drinking some scotch. So, thank you.